Well, good morning and welcome to our worship service this morning. I want to thank Cindy for reading the passage for today and uh, also for that heartfelt prayer this morning. Thank you. Uh, as we were reminded, today is July 4th. I was reminded last night as I fell asleep, I would hear firecrackers uh, in the neighborhood. And then uh, this morning, someone was very industrious, waking me up with firecrackers. So they were very patriotic. So uh, our country is not perfect. I think we would all concede that. And we have a number of different struggles and difficulties. But in my opinion, it's still the best place to live in the world. I am grateful to be part of this country and the freedom to worship and to gather together. And so uh, may God uh, continue to bless and protect and move us in the right uh, direction. We are working through the passages in Scripture. We're halfway there, so beginning of July. We've been preaching through the Scriptures. And uh, today is the last day on what we call the historical books from uh, Judges and uh, all the way to First and Second Kings. And we're heading into the prophets. And so starting next week, we look at uh, Hosea and God calling back his people. And uh, what a heartfelt cry of his love for his people. And then we'll look at the Jonah and how Israel failed to spread uh, the message of who God is into the foreign lands. We'll look at Daniel and their exile in Babylon, Jeremiah and their exile in Assyria, as well as New Covenant and Malachi. And so we'll finish up the Old Testament towards uh, around September, and then from there we'll hit the Gospels and make our way to Revelation so that on the last Sunday of this year, I would love it if we preach on Revelation 21 and 22. The story comes to an end, and it goes back to the beginning where God accomplishes what he starts as a demonstration of the truth that no one can stand in his way. His will will be done. And so this morning, we'll look at Elijah and the drought. Uh, Parts of California are sinking. About a foot a year, and some parts of California, two foot a year. That means that if you're standing in San Joaquin Valley today, about a decade ago, the landscape would have been 10, 15, even 20 feet higher than where you are standing. And why did this happen? Well, some of you know, in the western parts of our country, there's a drought coming, or there's a drought. So uh, it's known as a mega drought. It's been 20, 22 years since we had very little rain. Tree, tree ring studies have shown that this is the worst drought in 1,200 years. That means that you have to go all the way back to medieval times to find something that bad. In fact, things have gotten so bad that farmers are quitting their fields. Livestock are being sold early because uh, it's so expensive to feed them. They drink 40 gallons of water a day. And experts tell us that the price of beef will shoot up soon if things do not change. And we may be paying $10 a gallon for milk. So Californians have been drilling for water, drilling sometimes over 100 feet. So they would drill down, and they would pump up all this water, creating these vast cavities underground so the land is compressing, it's sinking. If you look at the screen, you see huge parts of uh, California in that map where that's occurring these days. These are the conditions that Israel was living under for three and a half years. Not one drop of water, not from the sky and not from the ground. If you remember last week, God called Elijah to confront Ahab to deliver a message that a mega drought is coming, three and a half years. And for a nation that does not have the ability to pump deep underwater, underground for water, or to build canals that transport water from 100 miles away, or desalinate salt water, this was devastating news, on par with war. And in 1 Kings 18, we learned the reason for this suffering. Ahab has abandoned the god of his forefathers, and he's whoring after foreign gods, in particular Baal, the god of weather, of storm and lightning. Now, in ancient polytheism, the people could not imagine a god that is of such a magnitude that he could rule over every part of the world, every part of our lives. So what they did was they divided parts of their lives and parts of the world into little segments, into little realms, and they would ex- 
assign particular gods to rule over these areas. So remember back in high school, right? In Greek mythology, you had like a god of war, you had a god of love, you had the god of the sea and the god of the underground, you have this god of traveling, so if you're on a journey, you would pray to that god, and then you have a god of feasting, of wine, various different gods. But in these collection of gods, usually there was one god that was really important, right? And so in Greek mythology, is Zeus. And he's important because he is the ruler over the most important area of our lives. And if you remember, Zeus was the god of storm, weather, lightning. This was also the case with the Canaanite religion. While there are many gods that are ruling over many different areas of life, there was one important god in the Canaanites. That was Baal. He was the god of weather and storm and lightning. Baal was the Zeus counterpart. In fact, there are some religious scholars who believe that they were identical. Now, Yahweh God comes along and he challenges this theology. So this is part of what the prophets are trying to teach the Israelites, that there are not many gods, but only one. Because the god that you worship is a God who has created heaven and earth. In other words, he is of such magnitude that he has the ability to rule over every area of this world and every area of your life. So that no matter how far you go, there he is. Assyria, there he is. Babylon, there he is. In fact, this is how the psalmist puts it in one of the most beautiful metaphors in Scripture, that if I ride the wings of the morning, so imagine if you're at the beach, like you're at the uh, Virginia Beach, per se. <laughs> Let's say you're out there, and you're early morning, you go, and the sun is about to rise, and as it's coming up, you see this arc of light that just spreads and travels across the sky. Even if I'm riding the wings of that arc, God is still there. Even if I go to the uttermost parts of the sea, his hand leads me. His right hand holds me up. Because Yahweh is not just a, a, another God who belongs in the pantheon of gods. He is the God of gods and the Lord of lords. In fact, there's only one God. And this is what made Israel so special. It wasn't the people so much. It was their God, who he was, that made him so unique because there was no one like God. Right? This is Isaiah's message. There is no one like our God. So when Ahab married Jezebel, we have a fundamental shift that's occurring. A transference of allegiance is taking place in the highest positions of Israel's government because in the past, right, all the northern kings, they're wicked, but they merely flirted with worshiping Baal. But when Ahab married Jezebel, things were starting to change. No longer flirting, it was moving to engagement. And engagement was about to move into marriage. And Israel was in trouble. Because Ahab is pushing Baal worship upon the people. And the people are a little bit confused and they're wavering and they're in doubt. Because uh, look at the next verse. This is 1821. Uh, Elijah says to them, how long will you go limping? I love that word. How long will you go limping? Uh, uh, the word limping has the imagery of swaying back and forth. It has the imagery of dancing. How long will you go limping between two different opinions, two different theologies, if Lord is God, follow him, but if Baal, then follow him. Make up your mind. Be loyal to one or the other, because God hates lukewarmness. This is a precarious time for the people of God, because the entire kingdom program, what God is after, establishing the kingdom of God, is predicated upon Israel being his representatives to tell the world what he is like. He is to be or there to be his priestly kings. But with Baal worship, his plans are about to fall apart. It's like shaft that the wind will blow away. If you want to get a sense of how dangerous this time was, now when you read Jeremiah, just count how many number of times Jeremiah condemns Baal worship because that's the most dangerous thing on the scene for Israel. And in fact, the only way that God can seem to get rid of Baal worship in Israel is to go to the most extreme and send them in exile to a foreign land. After the exile, you never hear bear worship. 
But God doesn't want to get to that point. And so before he gets to that point, he's going to send them trials, and he's going to send them a drought. And so he shuts up the heavens for three and a half years, and he hopes, this is enough. Turn, repent, because you don't want to get to that point of which I am willing to go in order to call you back. And in part, this is done to demonstrate how in that veil is. Because you see, the Mount Carmel is that climactic scene in Elijah's life. And God is preparing his people through this three and a half year drought to show that how weak Baal is. Because uh, can you imagine in those three years how many times the Baal worshippers are crying out and Israel is wondering, wow, will Baal respond by sending rain? And the heavens remain silent. And I think at some point the Israelites are thinking, Wow, maybe Baal isn't as powerful as what they made him out to be. And just like God dried up the brooks of Carith to move Elijah from a place of comfort to growth, he's using three and a half years of drought to try to undermine their confidence in Baal, to prepare them for the demonstration of his power on Mount Carmel. So in first verse of chapter 18, God is ready to move. He says, after many years, he calls Elijah. Elijah sends out a challenge to the priests of Baal. They'll build two altars, one for each god, slaughter an oxen, put it on the altar, and see which god will send lightning from heaven and consume it. And you guys are familiar with the story. All the way back from Sunday school, 450 priests of Baal, they're praying, they're dancing around. Now, the word is actually limping, limping around their altar, praying for God or their god to send rain from heaven. The heavens remain silent, and Elijah decides to turn the screws. In my mind, he's trash-talking. He invented trash-talking. Maybe your God is taking a nap. Maybe he's relieving himself and can't be bothered. And the derision inspires the priest of Baal to take it up another notch, and so they start slicing themselves, pouring blood from their body on the blood of the sacrifice, crying out for Baal to strike from heaven, but the remain silent. The skies remain quiet. And Elijah's turn. All he does is offer a simple prayer. And then he has the people pour four buckets or four barrels of water upon the altar. He does it three times so that there's no misunderstanding that this will be Yahweh who will strike. And after the simple prayer, fire strikes the altar like a missile from the skies. The sacrifice is consumed. And I love how the ESV puts it. The heat is so intense that it licked up the water that was in the trenches. And the people are convinced. I mean, how, how can you explain this away? You know, on a clear day, lightning comes right at that moment, precisely at that location. And they start crying out, the Lord Yahweh, he is God. The Lord Yahweh he is God, and you can imagine that the seeds of revival have been planted in their hearts, and the people have seen the dramatic power of God. Yahweh has gone into Baal's home court and destroyed him, and they gather all the priests of Baal, and they massacre them. And in Elijah's heart, he gets so excited because, wow, this may be the day. Perhaps this is the day that Ahab will repent. Generations of wicked kings have ruled over the northern kingdom of Israel. Perhaps this is the day. And so he sends Ahab back to Jezreel. And I think in his mind he's thinking that Ahab will, will destroy the high places of Baal. That he will begin to murder and kill the rest of the priests of Baal. That he will put away Jezebel and repent and bring revival into the land. But none of these things happen. It would be an understatement to say that things did not turn out the way that Elijah had anticipated. Man, if I wanted to convince a, people, a group of people that God was alive to have him shoot fire from heaven to consume a a water-drenched altar. I mean, it can't get any better than that. But Ahab doesn't repent. He does not turn to Yahweh. 
Instead, he turns to his wife, and Jezebel consoles him and comforts him and encourages him, and she takes matters into her own hands, and she says to Elijah, limb for limb, body for body, massacre for massacre, your turn is coming. And it is at this point that Elijah's other personality appears. Not the hero, but the coward, the wimp. And he hears his threat, and he takes off, and he starts running. He runs as far away as he can from uh, Jezreel all the way to Bathsheba. If you look at the map, there's no further south he can go. And then once he gets to Bathsheba, uh, he travels another day's worth into the wilderness just to be sure. And here's a guy who was compared to John the Baptist who grew up in the most rugged landscape. He goes and confronts Ahab in the king's court. He's brought food by ravens, by an angel. He's got the bowl of oil and a jar of flour that never runs. He raises someone from the dead. Calls fire from heaven. Outruns a chariot 13 miles. He prays and the sky shut up. For three and a half years. I've had a guy that taunts the priests of Baal, and yet he's trembling and running for his life. The two pictures, as I said last week, are very difficult to put together in the same person. We have a powerful truth here. The crushing weight of things not turning out the way you had expected. Past week, I've been uh, reading a book. I just finished it. Uh, it was, uh, boy, it was a very inspirational book. It's written by a survivor of Holocaust, a young Jewish girl at the age of 16 that was taken into uh, the Nazi Holocaust. She and her sister was taken into uh, Auschwitz, where they would work for the, for the war of the Third Reich. And she says that when she was in there, that she met this one uh, Jewish girl, and said this frail little girl, and she's thinking, how long will she survive? But this girl makes it day after day, and uh, as she's going through the hunger, and she's putting in all the hours and the, the, the atrocities of a concentration camp, and she's making it through. And all throughout that time, this girl is saying, look, on Christmas Day, we're going to be set free. Liberation will come. We're going to get to go home, and life will be normal. But on Christmas Day, when it comes and nothing changes, Edith Edgar writes that she could just see this girl's spirit just fading away. And then before New Year's Day, she passed away. See, this is the power of hope, of anticipation, that when we have hope, there's nothing we can't endure. We get up every morning and we do what we need to do but there's also the power of hope that is unfulfilled. We call it despair. And when despair strikes our heart, there's nothing we are not willing to do to make it go away. And this is what Elijah experienced. We cannot underestimate the despair that drenched his soul. He could barely breathe. His heart beating, can't focus. All of his hope for revival shattered in an unforeseen moment. I mean, if the miracle of Mount Carmel doesn't change Ahab's heart, I mean, what could? And then he uh, experiences the symptoms of depression, suicidal ideation, the fight or flight instinct kicks in, and he thinks, well, you know what? I'm going to run. And who can blame him? And then God starts the process of restoration. Like a good healer, he starts with the body, right? He lets him sleep, wakes him up, feeds him, let him sleep, feed, sleep, feed for several days. And then he sends him on a journey. And I find this very interesting. Not to the brooks of Karif like last week where you can spend time in personal retreat. Instead, he sends him off to Mount Horeb. You know what Mount Horeb is? That's Mount Sinai. That's where Israel received the laws of God. That's where Israel became the chosen people of God. That's where the, uh, the covenant promises are made. If the brook at Sharif is a place of solitude, then Mount Horeb is the place of remembrance. This is how I tell the difference. Uh, If you're a newly wedded couple, you go on a honeymoon like Hawaii. That's the book of Sharif, right? Spend time in solitude. But 
after 20 years of marriage and raising kids and, and keeping up a career, and you start to depart and you're struggling and you're fighting, Mount Horeb is going back to the place where he first proposed to you. See, the book of Sharif is a place of retreat to find ourselves. Mount Horeb is the place of significance to remember the promises that have been made to you. And once Elijah arrives there, he crawls into a cave and he falls asleep and the word of God comes to him because after the physical, after the reminding of the promises, it's time to restore his soul. And so God says, what are you doing here, Elijah? And Elijah vents, and you have to give people room to vent. And he says, look, God, I've been zealous for you. I gave you 110%, every ounce of my energy. I did it for you. And look at the results. Look at the fruits of my ministry. It's shriveled up like a drought. Look how he puts it for the people of Israel have forsaken your covenant, thrown away your altars, and killed your prophets. And with the sword, I, even I only, am left, and they seek my life to take it away. God, it's your covenant. It's your one. I'm doing it all for you. Where are you in this time of struggle and suffering? So right here, we have the ambiguity of the Christian faith. On the one hand, we have a God who can send fire from heaven and consume a water-soaked altar and he and he reveals himself in the most dramatic of ways and i'm wondering god why don't you appear more often like that i mean how many years do you have to pray for your relative before they get saved god why don't you hear those kinds of prayers what about my relative who has cancer what about all the difficulties and anxieties that i'm going through god what about your prophets that they're putting to death you're pretty quiet up there when things are in such havoc down here. See, the same problem of evil that appears to justify atheism. If I ever left Christianity, this would be the reason why. It haunts the Christian as well. And so God commands Elijah to go out of the cave and stand in the same place Moses did to encounter God in the most intimate of ways. And he says, look, the Lord passed by in a great and strong wind toward the mountains and broke in places the rock before the Lord, but the Lord was not in it. Now, oh, what is this section trying to teach us? How do we understand this enigmatic statement? It's, so we need to do a quick survey of how God used the wind in the story, right? So when you go back to the days of Noah, God sent the wind over the earth and the flood receded and a whole new world was born. In Exodus, God used wind to blow the locusts into Egypt. That's one of the ten plagues. He used wind to create a pathway. He split the Red Sea so that the Israelites could walk through. He used the wind to drive quail into the Israelite camp so that they could have food to eat. That's put an impressive list. And then the next element is earthquake. Earthquake. When the Israelites received law on the Mount Sinai, God shook the mountains. The earth literally quaked. And then when Jonathan attacked the Philistines, God shook the earth so that the enemies of God were in panic and they experienced the great victory. And then the third element, fire. Fire starting with Sodom and Gomorrah when fire comes down from heaven and consumes a city that rebelled against his law. Fire that burnt in the bush to call Moses to initiate the deliverance of Israel. A pillar of fire that led the Israelites to the promised land. And how can you not forget the fire that came from heaven and consumed the altar? But the text says that God is not in any of these dramatic, spectacular events. Instead, what we have is the sound of a low whisper, a quiet, gentle whisper. And when Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in cloak because he was about to meet God. So he veils himself and he stands at the entrance of the cave. What we have is a shift in the text from the dramatic and the spectacular to the understated, the moments that are so quiet that it slips below the radar. This is the voice of God that is whispering, and Elijah hears it. 
he recognizes that it is God, veils his face, and goes out to meet him by the entrance of the cave. So what is this passage trying to say? Now, I, I hate to do this, but I broke it up into four statements because I don't want clarity to be lost. So four quick statements. First, God has sovereign control over the natural world, but he rarely uses it. He rarely uses it. You know, for a God who created the heavens and earth with all the power to do the miraculous and the spectacular, he seems very shy about demonstrating his power. <laughs> if I was God, I'm not. I've been told by my wife, I am not. I could imagine far more wonderful ways of using that power than God does. The first thing I do would be walk through a hospital, boink, 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 and heal everyone. And revival would come throughout the land. In fact, we don't have to imagine too much because, you know, there are stories in the early church of what Jesus, you know, have you imagined what Jesus would have been like when he was five years old and 10, 12, 13 years old, right, with all that power? And so you have these stories in the early church where uh, writers would attribute uh, what Jesus would have done at that early age, and it's sort of a projection of what they would have done. And I love these stories. Uh, my favorite one is uh, Joseph is ordered to make a bed, and he's cutting lumber. He's supposed to be measured twice, cut once, but he doesn't, and one's longer than another, and Jesus comes into this work camp, and he sees the shortened piece of lumber, and he just stretches it out so that it's perfectly even. I mean, I would love to have a son like that. He molds clay pigeons. He breathes life into them. And then they fly away. Oh, he goes to school, knows every answer, and then he asks questions of the teacher that they don't know the answer to, and he answers it. How about that? He heals a man bitten by a viper, causes a boy to wither because he rebuked him falsely, and then raises him from the dead. And I could go on and on and on. Imagine what we would do with all of the power. I can tell you what, I wouldn't be so shy about using it. But he doesn't. He doesn't. Second, God often works in small ways which we hardly recognize. You know, my first ministry of being a youth pastor was at Bethel Church in Ellicott City. If you drive down uh, on Interstate 95 for about 30 minutes, you would come to the church. First time ministry, and I had not gone to seminary yet, and I did the best I could. After that year was up, I went to Dallas Seminary, graduated, went out to Irvine, California for youth ministry there. And the church there started this missions camp. So uh, they would bring in people from uh, youth groups and young adults from other parts of the country, train them. And then we had a, a, a camp in Mexico, uh, San Simon, where we take the kids there. And one summer, uh, the youth group and college group from Bethel Church out here came to California. And I heard, I was excited, and so I drove out to John Wayne Airport, and I met them, and several of them were in my former youth group, and we met, and we talked, and it was a joyful reunion. And then one of the kids pulls me aside, and he says, I have something to say to you. I said, sure, why? Well, I want to thank you for the ministry. <laughs> you know, youth groups rarely ever express their gratitude. I mean, you have to wait till they're older, and I was almost floored. And he tells me that of all the memories that he had of those ministry years, that ministry year, the one that stuck out the most was the time that I took the group out to get ice cream after Sunday school. It was the day he realized that teaching wasn't something that I just did. I really cared about the kids. I wanted to be with them. And as I was driving back from the airport, I started to think of all the sermons that I preached in that one year and all the Bible studies that I prepared and taught. And I'm pretty sure he wouldn't remember one bit from all of those. But of all the acts of my ministry, all it took was a 98-cent ice cream cone that he remembered after all those years. So often it's the little things in life that makes the most difference, isn't it? Sometimes all it takes is a cup of water. But when I'm thirsty, you gave me water. Third, God is always at work, even when we do not see it. Even when we do not see it. The Apostle Paul tells us that we are involved in this cosmic battle on two different dimensions, in the flesh and blood and above flesh and blood, in the spiritual realm. 
And at best, our little church and our little lives occupy this one little area in this one little battlefield in this campaign of a war that God is conducting. And there are times when things are occurring way over there that we have no idea of. Do not assume that because you do not see him working, that he is on a retreat. I'll give you a quick example. When Elijah was in the book of Kareev having his personal retreat, God was working because he was at Zarephath. Remember, he's with the widow, and he's whispering to the widow, you know, one of these days, one of my prophets will come to you, and I want you to feed him and take care of him. Or what about the 7,000 who have not bowed their knees to Baal? Remember, uh, Elijah says, I'm all alone. I'm all by myself. I'm the only prophet. I may be the only faithful Israelite. And he doesn't know that God has been speaking into the hearts of 7,000 of his people to turn them towards him just because you don't think God is working doesn't mean that he is behind the scenes orchestrating, making sure that his plan will be fulfilled. And then lastly, God works through his word, which we should not underestimate. You know, God often speaks in two different ways. There's supernatural events like the crossing of the Red Sea, and then natural events like rain. Through the heavens, it declares the glory of God. Through our conscience, when people dehumanize others. See, God's speaking to us through natural means. But then there's a special way in which he reveals himself. He talks to us. So that centuries past, he talked through his prophets. In the first century, he talked through his son. And then today, he's speaking to you right now through his word. And this passage is a reminder to all of us that while God is not always in the wind or the earthquake or fire, he is in his word. And his word, that gentle whisper, will not return void. It is his word by which he created the heavens and the earth. Jesus is his word. And the story will be completed with God having his last word as he finishes what he has started. And we see this in the parable of the rich man and Lazarus. You know, one of them is living in a mansion, is eating the best of the food, and Lazarus is out in the gate begging for food, and then both of them die. And when the poor man enjoys the afterlife, he's sitting next to Abraham, enjoying the pleasures of the afterlife. And the rich man sees that and he says, Oh, Abraham, allow Lazarus to go and dip his finger in water and bring it down and touch my lips. And Abraham says, Look, he cannot cross the divide between you there and him here. And so the rich man says, look, Abraham, I have five brothers, and they're enjoying life. But they're not thinking about the afterlife. Send Lazarus, because a a miracle. Can you imagine someone from the dead coming and speaking to you? And what does Abraham say? Look at the text. If you do not hear the gentle, quiet voice of God, neither will you be convinced by the wind, by the earthquake. And by the fire, do not underestimate the power of his word. So why is God so shy about using his power? The answer is actually really simple. Because you use power and you win admiration. God doesn't want your admiration. He wants your love. And so how do you win love? Through sacrifice. See, the most quiet whisper of God is the cross. The cross is an event so understated that the Jewish authorities and Roman government, it slipped right under their radar. A man crucified in the backward parts of the world. And yet God was in it like no other event in human history because it's the cross, the quiet whisper of God through which he will renew the world. He will forgive our sins. And he will make us his faithful and loyal people. If you have your communion elements before you, if you can pull them out. Because communion is an expression of hope. That when I look at the newspaper this morning or the news website, and I read about the COVID, and I read about a fallen building here in America, not in the third world, And I read about the political division in the land, and I ask, where is God? Communion is my reminder. This is my Mount Horeb. 
that God has promised that through the blood of his son that he will finish what he has started, that he will renew the world and he will bring his people back to him in faithfulness. And so if you have your communion element on that Passover evening, Jesus gathered together his disciples for that final meal and he took the bread and he prayed and gave thanks. And then he broke it and gave it to each one of them. And he said, this is my body. This is my body that is given to you, broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And they ate it together. And then likewise, Jesus took the cup of wine. And he said, this cup that is poured out for you. See, this is the new covenant. And the new covenant, that is our hope, that he will take away your hardened heart of stone and replace it with the heart of flesh. This is his new covenant. And they drank it together. At this moment, I want to just give you time to pray and to reflect. It could be about the message. It doesn't have to be. Just ask, Spirit, what are you trying to say into my heart at this moment? And I want to give you a few moments before our worship leader will bring us together in song.